Right. Well, good morning. good morning. Welcome to the St. Elizabeth Catholic Church uh, Scripture Study. Uh, this Sunday is the 17th Sunday of Ordinary Time. And I sometimes look at ordinary time as a time of learning, time that Jesus is trying to teach us things. And, and I think that's uh, what we embrace besides all the other feasts and uh, feast days and so forth. So ordinary time, it kind of gives us some time to reflect and learn from that. And as always, we will start off with our opening prayer. Yeah, so if you could stand. We'll pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Out of the death I call you, Lord. Lord, hear my cry. May your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, keep account of sins, Lord, who can stand? But with you is forgiveness, and so we are revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and I hope in his word. My soul looks for the Lord more than sentinels for daybreak. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is mercy, with him is my plenteous redemption and he will redeem Israel from all its sins. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So the first reading is taken from Genesis um, 18, uh, 20 to 32. Um, of course, dealing with uh, Abraham, uh, reflecting on his persistence <laughs> uh, and prayer to God himself. All right? So, is it something that we always got to persevere is continue to pray right, without ceasing? I think St. Paul even mentioned that, pray without ceasing. All right. And we'll look, go in a little bit more detail of why prayer is so important. All right. uh, the psalm is from 138 all right, in, in regards to um, asking for God for forgiveness all right, and the, the abundant mercy that he has for us. Uh, in the second reading, it's taken from Colossians uh, uh, 2, and then, of course, uh, the Gospel of Luke, where we all learn from Jesus how to pray. And that's what the disciple asked Jesus, how do we pray? All right. uh, we'll be focused a little bit on the Lord's prayers today as well. And I was uh, talking to Baza earlier. I, I mean, this particular Gospel right here, you can do a couple of days just going over the Lord's Prayer. I mean, there's just so much and so bountiful that um, I don't think I can get it done in about 45 minutes. <laughs> but we'll have some good discussions here. All right. So uh, we'll glance over the uh, Genesis. because um, it's quite a pretty long reading. So I'll, I'll start reading here. In those days, the Lord said, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grave that I must go down and see whether or not their actions fully co co uh, corresponds to the cry against them that comes to me. I mean to find out. All right. So people are crying out of all the sinfulness uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah that he hears, God hears our cry. All right. Again, our first prayer is we, we, we pray to him, he listens, and, so we're, and then again, he's going to come down, all right? He's going to send, all right, whatever we need, all right? So he's going to, he hears us, and he's going to respond to that. While Abraham's visitor walked uh, on further t towards Sodom, the Lord remained standing before Abraham. Now, just kind of reflect on what's going on is... A uh, Lot, uh, who is a nephew of Abraham, is living in Sodom uh, and Gomorrah. And again, it's very all those sinful acts that's going on. So God is going to go down there to try to save him. Right? Uh, God, uh, along with two messengers, right, uh, angels, came down and visited Abraham. And this is where... Uh, Abraham and God is going to, uh, to that mountain and basically send the two messages onward into Sodom uh, to investigate what's going on down there. So again, uh, Adam, I mean, uh, Abraham is with God at this time. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you sweep away the innocent with the guilty? And suppose there were 50 innocent people in the city. Will you wipe 
out the place, rather than spare it for the sake of the 50 innocent people within it. So he's asking questions. And after I read this about three, four times, it's, it's real interesting that he say Abraham drew nearer. Now think about that, just those simple words. Abraham drew nearer. What does that mean to us? What should we do? We should be drawn near to God and not distance ourselves from God. If, he want, if we want our petition to be heard and our cry to be heard. All right. For be it from you to do such a thing, to make the innocent die with the guilty, so that the innocent and the guilty would be treated alike. Should not the judge of all the world act with justice? All right. And here it is. We definitely know that there are people who is in good faith and there are people who aren't in orders and disorder. Okay. It's a so-called good and bad, if you will. Okay. But our God is a very merciful God. All right. Uh, <clears throat> the Lord replied, if I find 50 innocent people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Okay. Abraham spoke up again. See how I am presuming to speak to my Lord, though I am but dust and ashes. All right. What if there are five less than 50 innocent people? Will you destroy the whole city because of those five? All right. Abraham here is humbling himself. I'm just a lowly human being made of dust and ash. I'm not even <laughs> at your level, but would you? It's that question. Again, he's pleading for those innocents. And he answered, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. But Abraham persisted, that persistence going on, saying, what if only 40 are found there? He replied, I will forbear doing it for the sake of the 40. All right. That's a loving and merciful look, God. That based on the plea, he will forgive them even at 40. But you know, Abraham, <laughs> he's very persistent <laughs> about this. It goes out, his, he's interested, in Abraham is doing what we call intercessions for all those innocent people. He's praying for them. He's asking God all right, to save them. Then Abraham said, let not my Lord grow impatient if I go on. What if only 30 are found there? All right. So we know God is not the, he's a very patient God. All right. He doesn't just do that. He listens and he waits. Okay. He replied, I will forbear doing it if I can find but 30 there. Still Abraham went on, since I have thus dared to speak to my Lord, what if there are no more than 20? And the Lord answered, I will not destroy it for the sake of the 20. But he still persisted, please, let not my Lord grow angry if I speak up this last time. What if there are at least 10 there? And he replied, for the sake of those 10, I will not destroy it. Okay. Even to the ten, he would not destroy it. And that's why uh, from, uh, some scholars believe that the, the number ten is very uh, unique. In that uh, in the council in Jerusalem, the, the, the Pharisee, it requires ten to have a quorum, for example. So those, those numbers, <clears throat> he asked for six times, so I'm about the six days. All right? But his pleading is very persistent. And the prayer that, that Abraham is doing is, is also can be related to the intercessions uh, of those uh, innocence. So he's asking on behalf of another all right, uh, characteristic of the attune of God's mercy. All right. So intercession, he who prays looks not only to his own interests, uh, Abraham even humble himself with that, but also to the interests of others. All right. And I think sometimes, we, and that's why we pray uh, 
through the, the, the saint for, ask for the saints and Mother Mary for intercession on our behalf. And, and that is, is where the beauty behind this particular um, scripture is learning that we are uh, praying for others as others are praying for us. All right. Uh, even to the point of praying for those who do him harm. Now, as we reflect that, think about all the people that we get angry about, upset about, you know. And, you know, the, 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 uh, Jesus teaching about love thy enemy, right? And simply by that love, we, all we have to do is pray for that person. Not for the wrath, because that is God's wrath that is to, to give, not us. All right. And by praying for the other, even people that do, us, that do us harm, we find peace in that versus anger, frustrations, hatred. All right. And I find that practicing every day actually does work because I do find peace in that. All right. So I have no judgment on the individual when it comes to that. So I think that's pretty profound with that. Are there any questions with that? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. So we'll move on to the, the Psalm 138. Lord, on the day I call for help, you answer. All right. I will give thanks to, God, to you, O Lord, with all my heart, for you have heard the words of my mouth. In the presence of the angels, I will praise, I, I will sing your praise. I will worship at your t- holy temple and give thanks to your name. Because of your kindness and your truth, for you have made great above all things your name and your promise. When I called, you answered me. You built up strength within me. And this psalm is a psalm for thanksgiving to God. We give God thanks and we give him praise. Uh, We pray to the God. he is coming down to rescue us. All right? All right. More time than not, uh, we are faced with trying tribulations or something that's not going right, and we say, God, help me, help me. All right? The plea to rescue, and God comes down and help us. All right? So the act is not a private transaction, but a public act that starts surrounding nations to praise God. And by praising God, it brings us closer to God. All right? The more we pray. Okay. All right. The Lord is exalted, yet the lowly he sees and the proud he knows from afar. Though I walk amidst distress, you preserve me. Against the anger of my enemies, you raise your hand. Your right hand saves me. The Lord will complete what he has done for me. Your kindness, O Lord, endures forever. Forsake not the work of your hands. All right. So at this point, he has experienced that salvation, that trust in God. All right. In a time of need, dangers, we pray to God and ask for his interventions. All right. And come in to save us and rescue us. All right. So from uh, our CCC um, 23, I mean, 2639. We look at prayer of praise, and praise is the form of prayer which recognizes most immediately that God is God. We acknowledge that. Praises embraces other forms of prayer and carries them toward him who is its source and goal, the one God, the Father, from whom all things and to whom all we exist. Okay. So it focuses on pra- praising God all right, because he is the source of everything for us. All right. So the, the, the more we pray, the more we are basically in tune with him and move towards him in that regard. Okay. So that brings us to um, the second reading from Paul. Brothers and sisters, you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the power of God, who raised him from the dead. All right. What words kind of stand out in there? Anybody? Anyone? 
Buried, okay. All right. And raised from the dead, the two together. Buried from the dead, okay, and the two. And you were buried with him in baptism. That means our old self, through the baptism, all right, bless him in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, through that washing, we buried our old self and reborn, basically anew, all right, mm -hmm. in God. All right, in which you also raised with him in that. All right, so, so in essence, what Paul is relating to is that back to our baptism, okay, in Christ. All right, and even when you were dead in transgressions and the uncircumcision uh, of your flesh, he brought you to life along with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. I uh, understand when Paul relating from a circumcision to uncircumcision, because the, the old uh, uh, covenant with Moses uh, is the uh, circumcision, is knowing the, the law, uh, uh, the, uh, the covenant in, in Mount Sinai, um, versus the new law right now, is basically through the baptism uh, uh, that and, and Jesus Christ, through his resurrection, basically cleanse us of that. So therefore, we don't have to go and get circumcision from, uh, uh, in regards to, to prove out that. We just have to go basically through uh, believing Jesus Christ and God right, that lead us to that. Right? And the forgi forgi forgiveness of our sins. Okay. Obliterating the bond against us with its legal claims which was opposed to us he also removed it from our midst, nailing it to the cross. All right. When we talk about nailing it to the cross, what is he referring to? What is it that we're nailing to the cross? Jesus. Jesus. And what did Jesus die? What did he die for? For, for, for the sins. So... When we nail it to the cross, it represented that it's our sin that he's nailing it to. That's what he's dying for, our sins. Okay? It's not literally us being nailed to the cross. It's more of our sin that he's dying for. So when he say about nailing it to the cross, it's simply all of our transgression, all of our sins that he's dying for us. All right? And that's very, very, when you're looking at it, it's pretty powerful. When we look at it from that image, all right? Uh, of Jesus Christ uh, dying. So the, it's a metaphor, all right, about how God canceled the legal claim against us through Christ's cross, all right. All right. So again, Christ being uh, nailed on the cross, but men uh, by the bond, it is the legal claim being nailed, all right. Basically, that particular sin is what we're trying to uh, reflect on, all right. All right. Any other, anyone have any more uh, to add? Ramon, anything? Oh, I was just, when I have it in my mind, Jesus on the cross, I keep hearing the words that just seeing him on the cross is a, tells how powerful it was when you talk about that, that it shows God's love for us. And yeah. that's, you know, that's what it's all about. God did it, it his only got the son, because of much he loved us, because he definitely couldn't let us run wild. Yes. But, he has in a sense of free will, but he gave us redemption that there, it may be made possible that we can be with him in heaven. Yes, that's a, bit, a well, well put because it is, you know, he's the unble unble uh, unblemished lamb that died. Because usually in the old days, Moses' day, if you have any sin, you need to find a lamb, unblemished lamb, and make that sacrifice uh, on the altar. Here, Jesus is that unblessed Mr. Lamb that's died for us, for our sins, for all who so believe I, in him. I think a lot of people don't really know that or get that or understand that. Before he did that, no one died and went to heaven. No, correct. You know, they, they were in a dormant state. You know? And then when, then when he did that, we were allowed to go to heaven, our souls. So you will judge according to the law nature of the law of Moses. Yes. But the righteous, you know, win. Yes. But, I mean, but before that, until he dies, then the, the, the gate 
opens up and allow for the soul. And that's why he went down to the soul for all those that have basically uh, have been, uh, what do you call that, believing God and Christ, it will bring up. And that's where it allow us to have that eternal life with him. And that's something that we look forward to now our soul, but now also our body right, uh, in the second coming. So it's beautifully uh, uh, written and prepared for us. And that now brings us to the gospel. Uh, I love this gospel. It just... I was just going to say, uh, as you were just also saying, that's a, such a concise uh, statement of his, the death of Christ, his resurrection, and the purpose, all in just a short two-verse passage. It just sums everything up so beautifully. Yes. Um, everything that you need to know about what Christ did for us and what we can look forward to. It's a, it's a beautiful passage because there's so much to reflect on. Exactly. <laughs> Whew. I just, I, I just get chill just, read, just reading that and, and feel that. There's so much there. There is a lot. All right. But, but. All right. So the gospel is taken from Luke 11, 1 to 13. Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as for we ourselves forgive everyone in debt to us. And do not subject us to the final test. All right. And that particular prayer is what we call the Lord's Prayer. Right? And then we, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Catholic calls it Our Father also, correct? Or the, any other denomination call them Our Father? Because I remember asking one of my friends who's not Catholic, say that, uh, did y'all say the Our Father? Say, the Our Father, what's, what's that? You know, Our Father. Who are, oh, the Lord's Prayer, okay. So now that reminds me, okay, maybe I need to uh, look at it from the Lord's Prayer. All right, but that's where we got it from. Um, so what's really interesting about this particular prayer from Luke compared to Matthew, Luke has only five petitions, all right? And each of these are petitions. Father, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, that's two. Give us your daily bread, uh, that's three. Forgive us our sin as we forgive others. And then do not subject us to the final test. And that's only five petitions. But however, Matthew has a total of seven petitions. Okay? So I'm going to jump over here uh, for a comparison here. So in St. Matthew's version, he has seven petitions. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And this is the version that we actually dare to say uh, that we normally use commonly for uh, so-called our Father. Uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So therefore, uh, so in Matthew, a little bit longer, all right, uh, but we have seven petitions total, okay? So there's a relationship between those two. Um, and then the uh, doxology, for thy is a kingdom and the glory and the honor of God, right? Amen. And uh, again, encountering non-Catholics, say, why don't y'all say that last thing? Well, it's not in the scripture. It's the, the, the doxology is afterwards basically proclaiming that. They know that praise and amen, if you will. All right. So from Catholic, we, 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 we don't do that. Uh, we don't add that until the end, just like the Eucharist. Right? After our Father, there's a pause in there, and then we say the doxology. All right? So that's the difference. And that was actually taken from the Didish, uh, the apostle uh, teaching that they added on there. 
So that's known as the other longer, the third version, by including that um, uh, doxology uh, uh, in the end all right, to the Our Father. What's interesting about the Our Father is that we say Our Father. We don't say My Father. We say Our Father. And it is for all. all right? We are a community of brothers and sisters. It is for everyone that we say Our Father. And it's almost like we are also uh, intercession not only for ourselves but for everyone and for others. That's how we say our Father, uh, and as a communion uh, collectively. Well, uh, I mean, that's what Jesus, who is right, I mean, the reason he could declare, claim God the Father as his Father, mm -hmm. he said that. Yeah. I mean, he said, teach us to pray. And he started that off. Mm -hmm. Our Father, and it's for everybody. And he, even, even his, um, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the scripture, but he also say, not my Father, but our Father. All right? And so he mentioned that clearly, all right? that it's for, intended for all. all right? So when you look at the Lord's Prayer, it is truly a summary of the whole gospel. All right? And as, as I mentioned earlier, we can go on days and days just by reading into or having a better understanding of the, the prayer that itself, the Our Father or the Lord's Prayer itself, to encompass what the whole gospel entails. All right. All right. Since the Lord, after handing over the practice of prayer, say elsewhere, ask and you will receive. We always say that. And since everyone has petition with a, uh, a peculiar to his circumstances, the regular and appropriate prayer, the Lord's Prayer, is said first as a foundation of further desires. All right. So we always start off with that Our Father right, prayer. I think more than that, we usually open a prayer, open our session with the Our Father, all right, leading us to that. And that's taken from the catechism all right, of our faith. All right. After showing how, uh, how the psalm, the principal fruit of Christian prayer, and, and flow together in the petition of Our Father, St. Augustine concluded that run through all the words of the holy prayer in scripture and I do not think that you will find anything in them that is not contained and included in the Lord's Prayer. That's St. Augustine now, Peace Father. Very powerful. Alright, very powerful with that. All the scripture, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms are fulfilled in Christ. The gospel is the good news. It proclaims its, um, its first proclamation is the summarized of St. Matthew's uh, in the Sermon of Mount. The prayer to the, our Father is the same center of this proclamation. It is in this context that each petition bequeathed us, uh, to us, the Lord is illuminated. All right. So the Lord prayer is the most perfect of prayers. It is we ask not only for all things we can rightly desire, but also in the sequence that they should be desired. The prayer, this prayer, not only teaches us to ask for things, but also to what order we should desire them. In the order that basically praise to God and then our petitions in that regard, in that particular order. And what's, what's really that particular word order, there's a process into that. And usually when we move away from God, we are in a disorder. We're not following what he wants us to do. And I think that's where we struggle sometimes. It's what we want our own way instead of what God intends for us. So what we call an orderly fashion compared to an unorderly or disorderly fashion. All right. <clears throat> so the Lord's Prayer, how to be that name, has to do with faith, all right, with made holy, not holy, <laughs> I'll edit this here, but it's, it's to make us holy, all right? And this petition, the first three, carries us closer to, I mean, basically move us towards him, all right? Sacrifice, uh, Jesus Christ, sacri sacrificing Christ allows us to ha open that door, all right, to um, have eternal life. Thy kingdom come, all right? We in hope in that, all right? And we can see this, the kingdom of God, because why? Through Christ, through the Eucharist, he is here. His kingdom, he's open. He brought the kingdom to us. We can experience it through the Eucharist. Receive him daily. 
okay? And that will be done, which means the act, such as charity, the love of God, and the love that he has for us, all right? Give us this day our daily bread, all right? Expresses the covenant of goodness that he provides. Think about in uh, Moses' day when the bread or the manna from the heaven came down, all right, for the people. Here it is Jesus, the bread of life, comes down to us, all right? So therefore, we celebrate Eucharist every day to receive Christ every day on the daily, all right? Forgive us that sins may be forgiven, all right? As we forgive, and the funny thing is, like, just like, just as that my father is perfect, he used the word as, a similarity between what he's trying to do and what God or the father entails. Therefore, we start off, forgive us this day as we forgive. The word as here is to assimilate that comparison that we are to be that holy. And if God forgives, therefore, we have to forgive. All right. Lead us not into temptation. And for many years, that, that statement right there, lead me not. I say, well, why would you lead me? What we mean is through the Holy Spirit and strengthen us. It prevents us from going into that. We need his help because why we're tempted. The desire of the flesh, our desire is always being tempted, right? Who's a tempter in this world? The devil. The devil all right? But it is through the Holy Spirit all right, and God's strength who strengthen us to able to basically prevent us from that. So therefore lead us not by using uh, his strength. And then deliver us from evil, of course. All right? So free us from the uh, corruption of sin and death, all right? <clears throat> so let me jump back here, all right? So the other, the second uh, part and the third part of, the, of Luke, and he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend to whom he goes at midnight and says, friend, lay me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived at my house from a journey, and I have nothing to offer him. And he says in reply from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children and I are already in bed. I cannot get up to give you anything. I tell you, if he does not get up to give the visitor the loaves because of their friendship, he will not give, get up to give him whatever he needs because of his persistence. And the persistence is even when we ask God for help or whatever we are asking of him, it has to be persistent. God will always answer in his own time. Sometimes we want it our own time. And I think that's where the challenge is. That's where the persistence. All right? But the teaching is that you always praise to him. You always pray to him. Okay? Because he will always give. Not what we really want, but what we need, and then more than what we really uh, initially wanted. Yes. You know, I use this scripture here and this persistence, how important it is, especially in prayer. You know, you pray constantly for you know, all of them. But I use it as a demonstration of, of devotion. The repetition of prayer, tell me, tell me. As, as a mother, and she is our mother in heaven, it's, it's like a baby in a crib mm -hmm. who constantly cries. You know, she may close the door, but she constantly gets it. But even a, a, a little child will say, Mama, 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 constantly. And that persistence, you know, like I said, I get up and answer <laughs> because it's hard of hearing it. But still, you know, it, it shows up with that persistence. Yeah, and I definitely I love that analogy about babies because it's so true. Because when the kid cries for so often, <laughs> all right, fine, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, it, it, it's so beautifully said. And, and so thank you for that analogy, uh, Ramon. It's, it's definitely, but it, it is a persistence, all right. And and he closed off with this particular in the gospel. And I tell you, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. All right. Whatever you want, whatever you need, whatever you ask, he will provide. All right. And knocking, simply as knocking our, our, own, our own heart. All right. All right. 
For everyone who asks receive, and the one who seeks find, and to the one who knocks the doors open. God is promising here that whatever you want, I'm going to give it to you, all right, based on your need, as long as those needs are in good intentions, of course, all right, not for the fleshy, uh, for our flesh, but more of what our needs are. All right, as far as our soul and our spirit. What father among you would hand his son a snake when he asked for a fish? Or hand him a scorpion when he asked for an egg? If you then, who are wicked, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? I mean, this is a comparison. Even a wicked father will try to do what's best all right, on his son and the gift. But God is above that. All right? The father is above all that. He will give us more, all right, even better than what we could have ever imagined. All right? So the illustration here is that um, whatever you ask, you will receive. You will receive, all right? And it's, it's just amazing uh, what, what we ask for. I, I often ask for, uh, just myself as an example, I often ask for comfort and peace, all right? And there are times where he tells me, just don't worry about it. Just, just let it go and let him. And I find peace in that. Uh, even praying for, let's say, those who harm us, I find peace in that. But it's also our action that when he gives it, you got to, through the Holy Spirit, right, he guides it. We have to follow through with that, right, towards that. Right. Yes? Sometimes when we're praying, we're always supposed to pray for whatever God will is. Yes. Sometimes when we pray and we don't get the answer that we want or something happens and we can't understand it, um, it, can't, it, it can be comforting to remember that uh, God loves us uh, and no matter what situation we're in and maybe sometimes his no is response to us and one that's for our, our, our better interest than the yes. Um, and it's sometimes helpful and comforting to remind ourselves when we get that note that he loves us and we know whatever is happening to us is for our greater good because he does love us. Yes. Um, and that no is, is a kinder way of, yeah. of working out that will for and it's his will, all right, not our will. And that's what's something that we, we think that we're in control of things. And sometimes, uh, I still recall times where we would manipulate, <laughs> if you will, to see what God would do. I will, and we don't get it, then we get frustrated, angry, and, uh, and whatnot. But that's not what a prayer, and through prayer, brings us closer to him. Ramon? Well, I was going to say, it's that the reality of these words here, and it's hard not to understand here on earth. If you ask, then you will receive. In reality, all our prayers are answered when we go to heaven. Yes. Because everything that we could, add, could possibly ask for on this earth, whether it be releasing pain, suffering, or whatever it is, is answered in heaven where there's total fulfillment. Yes. We don't have no, any need of anything because our life is totally fulfilled. All prayers of everyone that's in heaven mm -hmm. are answered. Yes. So our prayers are not necessarily answered here on this earth, but they will be. They will be. You know, these uh, readings uh, really talk about, a lot about relationship with God. Uh, you know, uh, Abraham had, you know, the ultimate one-on-one -on -one relationship with God, so much that he could argue with him and uh, uh, bar bargain or haggle, whatever you want to call it, yeah. haggle with God over uh, the number of good people. But and then in the second reading, it it really does talk about restoring us to that relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, the sacrifice of Christ uh, brought us back into that relationship, or provides that a means to that relationship. Yep. And then, uh, of course, the last reading is a personal relationship with God, mm -hmm. uh, God as our Father. Uh, so it's a, it's a, 
But they really fit together well in this week's reading. Yes, yes, they do. And it all boils down to the fact that prayer, persistence, and the love of God and what he provides. All and, right. and another thing, when you pray to God, he knows what you want better than you know what you want. Exactly. Uh, you might ask for something that's kind of on the surface, but but he knows your, your deepest needs. And... Um, Sometimes years later, when you you look back and you will say, "Oh yeah, I, I got it. I, it wasn't what what I thought I wanted, but it's what I really wanted." Yeah, um, it, kind of like the uh, apocryphal songwriter Garth Brooks wrote, <laughs> "Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers." Yep. So. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely put. And, and you know, it, it's true. Something like a, we, we we don't know. We just assume that we know, but He knows. And I think that persistent prayer and knowing that that communal God, he will always continue to bless us. So some of the, the, the takeaway in regards to prayer is, is that it is a God's gift. He gives to us. Uh, it is a covenant between him and, communic- uh, and, and also communicating with him, but also as a mediator. We can use a prayer as a mediator. Prayer is a petition. It's also intercession, thanksgiving, and praise. Now what's unique is the Eucharist contains all of that. When we go to Mass and celebrate Eucharist, it's all encompassing. All the form of prayers are in that Mass. And how beautiful is that? Right? We celebrate all that through praise, petitions, intercessions, thanksgiving. All right? And it's all there. All right? That is a pure offering all right, of the whole body of Christ to the glory of God's name. And according to the tradition, is a sacrifice of praise. So, Thank you for all uh, present here today and to kind of uh, share in our uh, Sunday scriptures and your input to the Ramon. Thank you, um, Beza and everybody here. So with that, uh, we'll close out with our Lord's Prayer or the Our Father. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.